Well, I've got a question yeah. for you. These little boxes, before they know anything about a congressman or a senator, they just want to know, do you have a family? Do you have pets? What do you like to do when you're not being busy with your with your work, uh, hobbies or interests? So tell us a little bit about you, your family, and some of the things that you like to do in life. Well, we live right here in Mesa, not far from where everybody who's watching it is from. Uh, but I grew up in northern Arizona on a farm with 10 brothers and sisters. And uh, I grew up uh, milking a cow every morning. <laughs> and so it was a, a little different uh, type of growing up. But I grew up on the farm. In fact, if you see my the end of my finger, it's, uh, it's missing. Um, I left that end of a finger on a farm. There was an accident that uh, chopped the end of it off and they, they sewed it back on, but it fell off later. And so it's, it's shorter than the other one. But, uh, but, I, but I grew up on a farm and, and had lots of, obviously, pets. We raised cattle, uh, so we had lots of cattle. But we one thing we used to love to do in the summer is every summer we would have a, a, a red-tailed hawk, you know, like as big as an eagle. And uh, we would uh, grab one of those from a nest and uh, and raise it at home, and and uh, watch it as it learned to fly, and over the summertime, and then by the end of summer, it would fly a little ways off, and then a little further and a little further, always coming back for food, just like any pet would do. But then uh, ultimately, by the end of summer, it would be gone, and uh, we we did that uh, every summer for for several years. Probably wasn't. Uh, uh, the best thing to do for <laughs> wildlife service may not have been happy with it, but but as a kid on the farm, that's what, that's what we would do for pets. Uh, but we have five children. Uh, the youngest just uh, came back from a, a Mormon mission in Mexico. He had to come back a little early because of the coronavirus. So we have our youngest two at home with us, uh, home from school, and. Uh, but Cheryl and I, uh, over the past year after I left uh, the Senate, have been traveling around the country a lot and around the world. Uh, we were in Australia just a couple of months ago, and so we're enjoying this part of our lives. You know, um, Jeff, I, we all have interests and hobbies. You know, I, I like to run. Um, I know one of yours is very peculiar. You know, I, I don't know anybody that says, I'm going to find a deserted island with nothing on it in, in the Marshall Islands, and I'm going to go live on an island with nothing, no provisions or, or anything. And uh, I read something in the newspaper, and I thought, what would compel one to do such a thing? <laughs> and then I think you brought some of your colleagues uh, in Washington uh, with you. So tell us about that experience. And I, that's something that didn't have any relationship to your work, or maybe it did. But tell us a little bit about that adventure. Well, as I mentioned, I, I grew up, uh, you know, on a dry, dusty farm or ranch in northern Arizona, and uh, I loved to read stories when I was a kid about sailing. I, I would read sailing adventures, and there was one that really struck my fancy. It was called Dove, and it was about a, a 16-year-old boy who sailed all around the world alone. He circumnavigated, is what they call it, um, and I that that just captured my attention. And uh, after that, I, I couldn't stop reading sailing books. And I especially like the, the where something bad happened, where a sailing adventure uh, went awry, and uh, somebody ended up maybe on a deserted island and had to survive. So I would wonder if if I were deserted on an island, if I or marooned, could I survive by myself? So 10 years ago, I convinced my wife uh, to, to uh, let me go to the Marshall Islands right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I picked an island that was only about uh, the size of maybe 10 houses or so. So it's a small, small island. And uh, I didn't take any food or water with me. I just took a, a what's called a pole spear and a mask and fin and <clears throat> snorkel. I <clears throat> I took a magnifying glass to start fire, and uh, I just wanted to see if I could survive just by spearing fish. And the problem is there are a lot of sharks there. Um, if you have to go out in the water to to spear fish, then the sharks are there too. So it was a uh, it was a very difficult week, 
but I loved it. I, I, I loved being out there alone, completely alone. Well, a couple of years later, our two youngest, uh, who are now, you know, 22 and 20, uh, they were just uh, 13 and 15, and I took them back to the island. And uh, we survived for a week alone, no food, no water, same kind of deal. Then a few years later, I took uh, a Democratic senator, Martin Heinrich. I'm a Republican. He was a Democrat. We wanted to prove that Republicans and Democrats can get along. <laughs> you know, they, they seem to fight in Washington a lot. And so we went back to the Marshall Islands. And for a week, uh, we did the same. About all we had was a, a machete between us. So we had to eat uh, coconuts and spearfish, and uh, we tried for a week to start a fire, and we couldn't. So we had to eat raw fish, um, and uh, it was a long, tough week um, to try to find water. You get tired of drinking coconut water, I can tell you that. But uh, <laughs> but but I enjoyed it. And then just last summer, I took a group of six uh, six men in their thirties. They um, represent a company that they wanted to do a, a team building exercise. And so they took it to the extreme. So we went back to that island and for five days and nights, no food, no water, just survived. And uh, we dodged a lot of sharks and, <laughs> but it was, uh, it, was, it was fun in the end. And I, I still don't have it out of my system. I'd love to go back. Something tells me you probably will, uh, Senator Jeff. Um, none of us stand alone in this journey, each of us, um, have been influenced and, and inspired by others. Jeff, whose shoulders are you standing on? Who has informed your thinking uh, about the world uh, politically as a man? Um, who, are, who are some of the individuals that you draw strength and inspiration from? Well, obviously my parents. Uh, my dad set an example of public service. He was the mayor of Snowflake, Arizona. Uh, my uncle Jake Flake was the speaker of the house in Arizona, so they they had a record in, in politics. Um, and I have to say, my mom, um, she the one thing I always remember is she had on our refrigerator it was an old three by five card, just with the words written on it: uh, "Assume the best, look for the good." And and that was kind of our family motto, and I, I tried to live by that. Assume the best, look for the good. Most people are trying to do right. And um, most people are inherently good. And if you look for that first, you'll be better off, particularly in politics where it's uh, more often than not, uh, people yelling at each other, especially between the two political parties. But, uh, so I always took that from my mom. And I, in politics, uh, Ronald Reagan, he was president during a lot of the time when I was coming of age in, in high school. And I admired him greatly. And um, since then, I've been able to meet and work with a, a number of our presidents and a lot of good people in politics. So I've been very fortunate that way. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Um, we have a little boy. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's probably dialed in as one of these uh, boxes right now participating in our program. But he's in the second grade. His name is uh, Senator... Cash Oldham, and um, we call him Senator Cash Oldham because he has this dream of growing up and becoming a senator one day. He was reading a book about John McCain in his classroom and decided that that was how he wanted to make a difference, was to grow up and to become a U.S. senator. Can you tell us, how does uh, a little boy growing up on a farm, cutting off his fingers, grow up to become, <laughs> grow up to become uh, a, a world leader in representing our, our country and our, our state. How how do you close that gap? How do you have this dream and ambition and then make it happen in your life? Well, I have to say, uh, first, um, I, I one of the honors of my lifetime was be, to be able to serve with John McCain uh, for 18 years, first uh, in the House while he was in the Senate, and then uh, to be what what was usually referred to as the other senator from Arizona. <laughs> there was John McCain and the other guy. I was the other guy. Uh, but uh, but I, I really uh, uh, admired him a lot for what he had gone through, being a prisoner of war uh, and uh, serving the country that way. And he was one of my closest friends. I was there uh, with him the day before he passed on. 
And, uh, and so anyway, that was an honor. For me, I, when I was growing up, I had no idea that I would go into politics at all. I just know, knew that I enjoyed uh, uh, debating my brothers and sisters and, uh, and talking about politics. I did want a job where I didn't have to milk a cow every day. <laughs> I got a little tired of that on the farm. And I wanted to keep more of my fingers too. So, uh, but, uh, so I studied um, when I was in, in high school first, my government class. I really loved it. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and I, I thought that uh, I wanted to do things around government, but I never thought I would run for elected office to run to be a congressman or a senator. But, uh, but later on, as I uh, went overseas, I, I served a, a Mormon mission in uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe and learned to love Africa politics. Um, Nelson Mandela uh, was later released from prison in South Africa while my wife and I were in the country of Nigeria for a year. And, and I, I just uh, learned to love politics. So when I got back to Arizona, ultimately several years later, um, I was working uh, in and around politics, but, uh, but a seat became vacant. And um, I thought, you know, I, I've always loved being around it. I, I might enjoy actually running for office. And so I did. And I, I got pretty lucky. Uh, at my first try, I ran for, for Congress, usually, and, and frankly, a better route is to run for maybe student council and then uh, maybe for the school board later on or maybe for mayor or the state legislature, um, that would have served me better had I had a few other offices before. Uh, but I was fortunate and was able to win the election 20 years ago uh, for the House of Representatives. And, and I have to say what I enjoyed most uh, was you know, representing Arizona to be able to, uh, when people came to Washington like yourself and others to show them around and to show them how a bill becomes a law and, uh, and what uh, representative government, what represent a representative democracy really is. And then uh, to represent the country around the world, um, I was able during my time in the House and Senate to travel to probably between 80 and 90 countries, uh, some of them many times, and to see um, how they revere our country and our leaders um, because of the assistance and, and uh, what we've done for them, whether it's in war or peace. Uh, I've, I've always looked to U.S. leadership as something that's a good thing. So I've, uh, but growing up, I, I didn't know that this is what I was going to be doing. Um, but uh, but I, I was glad to have the background that I had. I think it uh, served me well running for Congress. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Flake, I know in any journey there's trials and triumphs and peaks and valleys, and certainly, uh, you know, you've experienced those, but, and I know your journey's not complete yet, but as you reflect back on all these rich experiences that you've had, Jeff, is there one or two that stand out that you could, um, that you could highlight? Sure. Well, the most difficult part about being in Congress is if you want to live in Arizona and keep your family here, that means that you have to commute to work uh, uh, 2,500 miles every week. And so I did a lot of that and uh, had to miss a few things at home, more than a few things. I, I do remember one, you know, our, our daughter, daughter Alexis, I think she was in junior high at the time. Uh, I was determined to get back uh, when she was, uh, you know, taking part in a play or she was singing or something on stage. And I remember rushing to the airport, rushing home, driving home as fast as I can, sliding right uh, under the door, you know, just as she took a bow and uh, finished her performance. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, there were a few too many of those. But uh, fortunately, I have a, a great uh, wife who, who uh, took care of the fort while I was away. But one memorable thing, probably the most memorable, is... Uh, I've always thought that the United States, uh, that people in the United States should be able to travel wherever they want to. And one of those areas is Cuba. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to play a role in opening up Cuba to American visitors again. And at one point, uh, I was able to fly down to Cuba um, to, to participate in what they call the prisoner swap 
or a spy swap. Uh, we traded a couple of Cuban spies that we had uh, for an American who had been convicted as a spy in Cuba. And so I was able to fly down on one of the president's planes and pick up uh, this person. His name was Alan Gross and bring him back to the United States. I had been visiting him in prison uh, down in Cuba before and and he was uh, he was in a really bad way. Uh, but to be, be able to bring him back to the United States, and I'll never forget, as we were flying home to the United States, our pilot uh, came on and said, we've now entered US airspace. And Alan Gross, who had just spent five years in a Cuban prison, stood up and, and just very emotionally uh, shook his fists in the air and, and then breathed in and out very deeply saying, now I know I'm free. And uh, it just uh, reminded me again, what a wonderful country we have here and to never take for granted the freedoms that we have. Well, thank you for sharing, Jeff. I'm, I'm gonna ask just one more question and maybe we can go to your reel out. But, you know, as I look back as a younger principal at Barbara Bush Elementary School, um, our secretary, this is a funny story, boys and girls, her name was Carol Mortensen, and she actually was the secretary that opened the Harris School 18 years ago. I brought her with me. But she came into my office and said, uh, she called me Michael. She was kind of like, she was old enough to be my mother and, and uh, kind of treated me like I was her son. <laughs> she goes, Michael, I just got an interesting phone call. They said they were calling from Air Force One. And I said, really? And immediately I thought of you, um, Jeff. And and I think she hung up on whoever it was that was calling the school. And I said, if they call back, don't hang up. I said, I have a feeling that that might be, um, and I can't remember if you were, I think you might've been in Congress or a newly elected Senator at the time. And it was you flying over with uh, President Bush, number 43, George W. Bush. And you had an opportunity uh, to say hello to Alexis from Air Force One. And I think you introduced her to the president, does that sound like, uh, do you recall that? I do, I do. One of the best things about uh, flying on Air Force One, and I was able to do that a few times when the president uh, was flying to Arizona or from Arizona to Washington, uh, was if you pick up one of the phones on the plane, uh, the operator says, uh, Air, Air Force One, you know, who, who do you want to call? And so you give them the number and they call and they say, Air Force One calling for, you know, whoever. And so I thought, oh, this is great. So I, I called my mom, she was all impressed and, and uh, called a few girlfriends who dumped me in high school, you know, that kind of thing, but, <laughs> just to impress them. But, uh, but I did a few times call the kids at school uh, so, so they could get a call from the intercom saying Air Force One calling for Alexis Flake or for Tanner Flake or Dallin Flake. And so, yeah, that was that's one of the, the the perks that you you get to have sometimes is flying with the president, uh, and it's a little better than flying on Southwest Airlines or American Airlines or any of the others. You know, of all of your accomplishments, and I followed you very closely through the years, the one that I'm most in awe of is knowing that you were invited to go to the White House. I think you shared once with me that President uh, Obama took out the tennis courts and put in a pickup basketball court and that you were one of the regulars that would go play ball with them at the White House. <laughs> well, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, he liked to play ball and he was a good ball player. And uh, so, in fact, uh, he sent me a note on my 50th birthday and and he wrote at the bottom, he said, uh, said being 50 is great. He just turned 50 a bit ago. He said, but it kills your jump shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yeah, well, thank you, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, would you like to read the boys and girls a story? You bet. You bet. This is one of my favorites, and uh, appropriately, duck for president. How many, uh, by raise of hands, have read this book? Oh, a few have. Good. Well, anyway, I, I like it, and. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't run for president, but uh, I've run for some of the other offices they're talking about here. So we'll go through this one. <clears throat> and it also, the background is a duck that was raised on a farm, just like I was. So, duck says, running a farm is very hard work. At the end of each day, Farmer Brown is covered 
from head to toe in hay, horsehair, seed, sprouts, feathers, filth, mud, muck, and coffee stains. He doesn't smell very good either. I can attest you don't on the farm. Uh, the animals had chores to do too. The pigs cleaned under the beds, the cows weeded the garden, the sheep swept the barn, and duck was to take out the trash, mow the lawn, lawn and grind coffee beans. At the end of the day, the pigs were covered with little bun with lint bunnies, the cows were covered with weeds, the sheep were covered with dust, and duck was covered with tiny bits of grass and espresso beans. I know what that was like. I had to, not many people have had the experience of getting to school and being asked to wipe the manure off your shoes before you come into class. So I'm one of those. <laughs> Duck did not like to do chores. He did not like picking little bits of grass and espresso beans out of his feathers. Why is Farmer Brown in charge anyway, thought Duck. What we need is an election. He made a sign and hugged it up in the barn. Farmer Brown must go. Farm election. Tomorrow. The next morning, Farmer Brown found a poster on his front door. Vote Duck for a kindler kinder, gentler farm. My slogan actually was another flake for Congress. That was, that worked out really well. But <laughs> <laughs> that really wasn't, but most people thought that was my, uh, <laughs> Farmer Brown was furious. He ran to the barn and found the animals registering to vote. It says voter registration. Voters must live on the farm, show valid ID, be at least this tall. Said the mice got together and protested the height requirement, so Duck crossed it off. On election day, each of the animals filled out a ballot and placed it in the box. The vote was counted, and the results were and the results were posted on the barn door. Farmer Brown, six votes. Duck, twenty votes. Farmer Brown demanded a recount. One sticky ballot was found stuck to the bottom of a pig. The new ballot was Farmer Brown, six, Duck, 21. Duck picked up one vote. The voters had spoken. Duck was officially in charge. Running a farm was very hard work. At the end of the day, Duck was covered from head to toe in horsehair, seeds, sprouts, feathers, filth, mud, muck, and coffee stains. Running a farm is no fun at all, thought Duck. <clears throat> that night, Duck and his staff started working on Duck's campaign for governor. Vote for me. I'm a duck, not a politician. That's a smart, smart politician there, really. <laughs> duck left Farmer Brown in charge and hit the campaign trail. He visited small town diners. He marched in parades. He visited town meetings. He gave speeches that only other ducks could understand. When you campaign for office, you have to knock on a lot of doors. And I did. When I ran for Congress, I had a little uh, golf cart. And I would go from door to door and just run as fast as I could from door to door, trying to get people's votes. And usually if you went to their door, you had their vote. And that's, that's how I won, I think. On election day, the voters filled out their ballots in booths all over the state. The vote was counted. The results were posted in a local paper. Duck wins by a nose. Miss Governor, 299,999 votes. Duck, 300,000 votes. The governor demanded a recount. Two sticky ballots were found stuck to the bottom of a plate of pancakes. Now the governor had 299,999. Duck picked up two votes. The voters had spoken. Duck was officially in charge. But running a state was very hard. At the end of the day, Duck was covered from head to toe in hairspray, ink stains, scotch tape, fingerprints, mayonnaise, and coffee stains. He had a very bad headache. Running a state is no fun at all, thought Duck. That night, Duck and his staff started working on a presidential election. A duck for a change. I like duck. <laughs> duck, this <laughs> proud again. <laughs> duck left his staff and hit the campaign to kiss babies and local diners. He rode in parades. He gave speeches that only other ducks could understand. He even played the saxophone on late night television. President Clinton, when he ran in the 1990s for president, 
he did that. He played the saxophone on late night television and it made people like him. And uh, he won that election. On election day, the voters filled out their ballots in booths all over the country. The vote was counted, the results were in, announced on CNN. Mr. President had 50,546,165 votes. Duck had 50,546,170. The president demanded a recount. 10 sticky ballots were found stuck to the bottom of the vice president. The new tally was, Mr. President, 50,546,165 votes. Duck, 50,546,180 votes. The voters had spoken. Duck was officially in charge. You think he liked it? Uh, I'm not sure. Running a country was very hard work. At the end of the day, Duck was covered from head to toe in face powder, paper cuts, staples, security badges, social security agents, and coffee stains, and he had a very bad headache. Running a country is no fun at all. Oh, Duck? There's Duck in the Oval Office looking out. He then checked the Help Wanted ads. It says, Duck needed. No experience necessary. Must be able to mow the lawn and grind coffee beans. I think he thought that sounds pretty good. Duck left the vice president in charge and headed back to the farm. At the end of the day, Farmer Brown was now covered from head to toe in hay, horsehair, seeds, sprouts, feathers, filth, mud, muck, and coffee stains. And what was Duck doing? He was working on his autobiography, of course. <laughs> uh, it says up here, four score and seven years ago. Now oh, that sounds too politicianist. That sounds like Abe Lincoln. And then he says at the end, running a farm is very, oh, is very hard work. So no matter, no matter where you are, it's pretty hard work. But uh, but I can tell you, running a country is hard work. And uh, fortunately, we have people who are still willing to do it. And I hope uh, a lot of you run for office someday. Thank you, Senator Flake. I can tell you are a seasoned read aloud dad that I'm certain has read uh, to those kids of yours on many occasions. We have. <laughs> hey, uh, last question I'll ask Jeff, and we'll turn it over to the kids. Uh, tell us about your life as a reader. I know you're very well read. Uh, what do you read? Um, in 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 all different arenas, uh, as far as your 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 inquiry into leadership, and then just for enjoyment, what tell us about your readerly life? Well, I, I mentioned that uh, um, I love to read uh, mostly nonfiction. Um, I if I had time to read fiction novels, I would do it. But uh, but I, I love nonfiction, particularly adventure uh, stories. And uh, from the old age of adventure around the turn of the last century, um, that I particularly like. not just sailing adventures gone bad, but uh, other exploration. I've been fascinated with the continent of Africa. Uh, I've spent about three years of my life there. And uh, so I love uh, uh, stories about uh, Africa coming of age, basically through the colonial period and today. And then... Uh, Leadership uh, books as well. Um, I, I, I obviously political books. Um, I read them as they come along. There, just finished one uh, just a, a few uh, months ago that uh, explained the last several elections. And uh, but then uh, on on leadership um, histories uh, of Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, authors like John Meacham. Uh, he's got a great book that I read a while ago called The Soul of America and talked about America coming through difficult times, saying that this is a difficult time that we have now, but we'll come through it uh, because uh, we've done it before and we've faced bigger challenges in the past. So uh, reading is, is wonderful. For several years while I was uh, um, serving in Congress, I would, as I mentioned, commute 2,200 miles every week, one way or the other. And so it left about uh, eight hours where I could read. And then they got Wi-Fi on planes and movies and that kind of killed a lot of the, the pleasure of reading. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but I was able to read a lot and, uh, and keep a good journal of what was happening in Washington. 
And so I, I miss uh, those times to be able to have a uh, time allotted where I could just read. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Jeff. Um, would you be uh, okay to entertain a couple of questions from the kids? You bet. Boys and girls, if you have a question for Senator Flake, raise your hand and we'll call upon uh, a few of you for some questions. Let's see. I am flipping through the uh, pages of little boxes here. Um, and Abigail, you have a question? You could go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. How is it like when you were doing the job? Well, well it, sometimes it's hard work, like Duck found out. <laughs> the, the hardest work is, is being away from your family uh, for so many days during the week. Uh, but, uh, and sometimes when there's something like is happening today with the coronavirus, members of Congress aren't able to be in Washington so they have to be away and that's difficult as well, knowing that you should be um, representing your your constituents in Washington, but uh, this, this disease that's going around isn't allowing you to. Um, during 9-11, um, that was a very difficult time. Mr. Oliver mentioned that our, our kids um, were at, at, at Barbara Bush Elementary School the day that 9-11 uh, happened and and uh, somebody had to call them and tell them that uh, you know a plane had run into a, a tower in in New York and a plane had crashed in Washington. And my kids at Barbara Bush Elementary School were very worried about their dad. And uh, Cheryl at that time was flying back from Washington to Arizona. So she was in the air during that time. And she ended up being grounded in Wichita, Kansas for three days without her family around. And so it's not only difficult sometimes for the member of Congress, but uh, for the family as well, because they have to pick up the pieces often. Good question though, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Let's see here, <laughs> trying to navigate through all the, the screens. Okay, the uh, Maryland family, go ahead and unmute yourself. Question. Does the president ever disagree with you? Yes, yes, um, uh, quite often. And uh, now I'm, I'm a Republican and sometimes, usually Republicans agree more with Republicans, uh, but often they don't. Um, so, but a senator, uh, when you're a senator, you're not elected to agree with the president all the time. Sometimes you'll agree with him, uh, sometimes you won't. Uh, and uh, when you disagree with him, that's okay. Um, but you, you would just vote against maybe one of his proposals or a bill that he supported. Um, sometimes the president says, all right, I understand. And sometimes the president uh, is a little upset with you. <laughs> but that's okay, because you're there to represent uh, the people of your state. And uh, sometimes they'll be in agreement, sometimes not. But one thing you have to remember, though, is you can disagree with somebody and still not be mad at them or not yell at them. Um, you can just uh, agree to disagree sometimes. You know, Senator, Senator Flake, um, just a few weeks after September 11th, I was at... Um, uh, in Washington, D.C. with Steve Trussell, a sixth grade teacher at Barbara Bush Elementary School, and the Capitol was closed, but not to you. And you brought us in, and we went down on the floor at the house, and um, I looked up at those numbers that are lit up that reflect how you, you voted. And I remember asking you a question about how I noticed in the East Valley Tribune, it would say how your lawmakers voted. And and um, I think there were over 400 congressmen, were there not, uh, I think that was about the number. And there were times where I would, I would look at that and I would see that there were 440 something that voted yes, and there might've been three no votes and you were one of them. And I remember asking you the question, what, what is that like when you stare at that screen and you see that you're one of only three yes votes or three no votes? And 
I remember you saying, you just pray that somebody else is going to vote and you're not going to be the only voice. But I have always admired you, Senator Flake, for speaking your truth and, and voting on your principle. And that's, I think, of all the virtues that I respect and admire about you. It's how you have always spoken your truth, uh, no matter what. So I, I value that uh, in you as a, as a political leader and as a friend. Any other questions? Let's see, Jaden. Jaden, do you have a question, buddy? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. That little orange microphone at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that little microphone and it'll go from, there you go, I think you've got it. Okay, go ahead, Jaden. Why didn't you record? You said career. Career, will you must be remembered for? Oh, what will I most be remembered for? Um, well, probably in the, when I was in the Senate, there was a, a very controversial uh, vote that was coming up. Uh, we were to vote on, on confirming a judge. And, uh, and my party, the Republican Party, really wanted to, that vote to happen. And, and I thought that we weren't ready for that vote yet. So... I, uh, I demanded that we, we wait and we have an investigation. And so um, that vote uh, was delayed and uh, my colleagues, my Republican colleagues there, those serving with me weren't very happy with me <laughs> for, for delaying the vote. Uh, but I, I thought it was the right thing to do. And uh, I think there was so much focus around the country uh, on that vote, that uh, that's probably what I'll be remembered for most. That's in the Senate. In the House, probably because, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Oliver said, I sometimes voted uh, very lonely um, against uh, spending, some kind of spending items called earmarks, um, or sometimes called pork barrel spending. And for years, uh, I, I forced a lot of votes there, and it, I was usually just uh, me alone or just a few, but ultimately uh, we banned the practice of earmarking. So I thought that that was a good thing. And that's probably what I'll be remembered for in this in the House more than anything. But thanks. Great question. You know, Senator Flake, what I'm going to remember you most by was when um, Gabby Giffords returned to the arena for the first time and she chose you to accompany her. And I'll, I'll never forget you walking in with her as she was struggling to rebound. And uh, you, a Republican, and, uh, and Gabby, uh, a Democrat, I've always thought, you know, that you have really tried to put aside uh, politics and do what's right and to, um, to not just vote according to your, um, your political affiliation. And I think you've won a lot of friends and a lot of hearts by doing that. Certainly that was something I'll always remember you by is to me, that was a symbol of what could be a Republican and a Democrat, you know, united um, in walking into that arena, what, which must have been so difficult for her. Uh, any other questions for, uh, for Senator Flake? Let's see, it looks like uh, Bauman. The Bauman family, 1329. There you go. Go ahead and click your mute button. Um, what do you do in your job? Like, what are you supposed to do? Well, when you're in the, the Senate, <clears throat> you, you have to be back in Washington to, to debate and to, uh, to have hearings and to look at bills or legislation or laws that we should pass. And then you and your colleagues, and in the Senate, there were 100 of us, two from every state. And then we would uh, go on the Senate uh, floor in the Senate chamber and vote. If we wanted to, uh, to vote yes, we would go like this. And if we wanted to vote no, we would go like this, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And then they would count the votes and uh, see if a, a bill would pass. So that's 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 really at the heart of what you do. There are a lot of other things that you do as well, though. When you represent a state like Arizona, 
Uh, sometimes there are people in Arizona who may might be traveling around the world in Mexico or uh, somewhere in Africa and they need to get home and can't get home uh, or a country is holding them and, and you might uh, um, you know work with uh, leaders of other countries to make sure that those Americans can get home um, things like that uh, so or if people um, aren't getting uh, their their benefits uh, like Social Security or retirement benefits you make sure that uh, the federal government works for them. Good question, thanks. Senator Flake, thank you so much for joining us today and being so generous with your, your time. On behalf of all of our Zaharis families, we're very grateful to you for that. Um, please tell your amazing family um, and, and kids uh, that I said hello. Um, I think I got to know Big Al probably better than all of the other uh, kids because my daughter Brittany is such good friends with her but uh, I love you and your your family and hello Cheryl. Hi. How are you hello. doing? It's so good to see you again. It's been too long. Here's where all of the Zaharis community discovers that Senator Flake married way above his head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well he was he was telling stories that involved you. And, uh, oh, well uh, we have great, great memories of 20 years ago almost with, with Mike yeah. Oliver, and we're yeah. just thrilled that you were such a big impact on our children at Barbara Bush. So thank you. We were we were actually angry that they took you away to Zaharis. <laughs> well, I have fond memories, fond memories of those uh, experiences and, and really value the friendship, uh, Jeff and Cheryl. Hey, thank, thank you, you for having us. Appreciate it. Tell the kids I miss them. Boys and girls, let's wave to uh, Senator and Cheryl Flake. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.